Well, did you have a good Christmas? My car got stolen on Christmas Day. How about that? Merry Christmas! Like, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Isaac walks into my room. We had a loaner, actually. Our car's in the shop getting serviced, and uh, they gave me a loaner. And uh, my son's like, hey, man, what are you doing here? I'm like, uh, sleeping. And he's like, well, where's your car? I'm like, out in the driveway. He's like, no, it's not. I'm like, yeah, it is. He's like, no, it's not. I'm like, well, I know I don't drink. <laughs> I didn't park it down the street. And sure enough, I walk outside, and the car was gone. I was like, okay, praise Jesus. So I was working with cops. That was my Christmas. How was yours? Was it good? <laughs> so don't complain, amen, <laughs> about that gift you didn't like. <laughs> no, but it's all good. I'm telling you, God has amazing things in store. Isn't that just like the enemy? Try to distract you right before the new year. But guess what? I told the devil, you're not going to rob my joy. You're not going to steal my peace. I have the joy of the Lord. And then I started singing that song. I have the joy, 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 joy. Hey, okay. All right, I want you to go ahead and uh, open up your phones real quick. If you don't have the church app, listen, today I got a lot to say, and I got a lot of notes. I am going to prep you for the new year. Now, I'm telling you, the message I have today is going to set you up for success. I have placed my notes this morning, which you have to do a lot of fill-ins, on our church app. If you go to our church app, you download it, right? If you already have it, great. Go to the part that says notes, and there's going to be a lot of fillings we're going to do today. The reason I'm doing this is, is, is for this purpose. I want you to do a filling. I'm going to show you how to set yourself up for a better version of you, a better year in 2020. And so please, growth starts right now. If you're a note taker, great. If you're a pen and paper, go for it. But I made it easier for you because I have all the verses on the app and everything. And then what you do is just email those notes to yourself. And then you're, you're going to take the next two days and you are going to be intentional. Look at your neighbor say, you're going intentional now. Yeah. All right, here we go. First Corinthians chapter 1, this is the Apostle Paul. He's talking to the Corinthian church right here. Now he's talking to the Californian church. He's talking to you and me in this verse. Listen carefully. Look at this. Verse 26 through 31 says this. It says, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. In other words, hey, do you remember who you used to be? Well, guess what? You should be someone different now, but let's talk about who you used to be and who you are now. He says, I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Thanks, Paul. Not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? Chose these nobodies. Look at this. Chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. Look at your neighbor and be like, man, good to meet you, nobody. <laughs> that right there should give you some really, like, like thank you, Jesus, that even Paul thought I was a nobody. But let's keep reading. He says, you were nobodies to expose. To do what? Expose. See, your life should expose that God is in it. Because if it was just you alone, then you'd still be a nobody. But when God is invested in your life, you're somebody. Amen? He says, that makes it quite clear that none of you can get uh, by with the blowing your own horn before God. In other words... You can't be the person that goes, doo, 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 like today. You're either applying what I'm going to share with you. You're either taking notes. See, because the person that blows their horn is not necessarily the person who's prideful and arrogant and goofy. But do you know that you can have this thing called false humility? False humility is the person that sits in here and says, well, I, I think I'm good. I love my job. I love my family. I'm good. Listen, that's blowing your own horn right there. Because how many know that God is not a God of enough? God is a God of more than enough. Okay, so God is always trying to, you're attending a place called elevate. God doesn't elevate you one time. God elevates you constantly. God is taking you to new levels 
ongoing, continually. He doesn't stop. God wants to promote you. God wants to elevate you. God wants to take you into new seasons, higher seasons, blessed seasons, overcoming seasons. But we have to understand, as Paul is talking to the church, look what he says. He says, so I don't want you to be the person that sits there and acts like I'm good. No, you're not good. You and I, we must take this life to the next level in 2020. It's not an option. It's not even a suggestion. It's a commandment. Look at this. Everything that we have, look at this. Everything that we have, right thinking, say right thinking, right living, a clean slate, a fresh start, comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. Come on, I don't know about you, but how many, is, how many here are ready for a clean slate in 2020? How many are ready for a fresh start in 2020? Are you even excited about that? How many are ready for some right living? Maybe you haven't been living right, but guess what? The mercy of God allows us to come back to the place of right living. Isn't that good news? No condemnation. And especially this one, I love this one, right thinking. Come on, we need some right thinking back in the church. Let me give you a quote I've been saying for the last two months, and I've been saying it with intention, and it's simply this, a new you does not make a new you. A new year does not make a new you. A new you makes a new year, but that only happens in Christ Jesus. So if you want right thinking, that only comes in Christ Jesus. Come on, if you want a clean slate, that only comes in Christ Jesus. If you want right living fresh start that only comes through jesus christ that's what the apostle paul is trying to tell every single one of us and so a new year here's what a new year does a new year a new year does give you the opportunity to redefine our priorities so it's not just like okay great because i know that many people think that there's this mindset in the world where they think that the moment the hand hits the midnight clock hour that everything changes. No, nothing changes. No. Look at your neighbor and be like, mm -mm. no, nothing changed. You know, the only thing that changed was the little hand on the clock. But guess what? You're still there. So it's not like the clock just goes midnight, like, bing, I'm so, fr I'm new. Yay. Woo. No, no, no. It's just another day. It's just a calendar. It's a piece of paper with numbers on it. That does not change your life. Jesus Christ changes your life. So it's not about, hey, I can't wait for the new year. Hey, aren't you ready for the first? No, 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 no. You should start thinking right now, today, this Sunday. Today, Sunday, December 29th. I am ready for a new me so that I can experience a new year. That's what God wants for every single one of us. So we have to redefine our priorities. That's what you have to do right now. From here to Wednesday, which this Wednesday is LA night, I'm inviting every single one of you because this Wednesday we're going to get before the presence of Almighty God and based on what we redefine as priority, the next two days, that's going to set our life on course for 2020 and it's going to be incredible. In other words, when I say redefine our priorities, what really matters? Now, don't be that person, please. You're more smarter than that. Don't be that person that writes goals like this. Read my Bible. Pray. Go to church. No, everybody say, duh. That's the given. Like, you should be reading your Bible. You should be praying, right? You should be, go I mean, we should, right? We should. And so I am saying this. When you write goals, you should, you should categorize them. Spiritual goals and then your practical goals, right? But your spiritual goals should be the foundation that's going to sustain the very goals that you're going to begin to write on the piece of paper. You can't. That's why he said, if you want right living, you want a clean slate, you want a fresh start, you want righteousness in your life, only in Christ. Outside of that, it's just you. It's just you. Let's keep talking. So when we think about what really matters, obviously, drawing closer to God matters, right? That's why we're going to be fasting and praying for 21 days in January, and you'll hear more about that later. How about growing in God matters too. You can't keep being someone that attends church, but you're not growing spiritually. God wants you to grow up spiritually, relationally, socially, 
economically. God wants us to grow in every possible way that we can grow. God is a God who grows. If you read all throughout the scriptures, especially New Testament scripture, God talks more about sowing than healing. There's something about what you're planting. You have to plant seeds inside your life. The greatest investment that you can have or that you can make is you. Make an investment of God inside of you. So drawing closer to God is a great investment. Growing in the things of God is a great investment. Living with intention. Living intentionally. Living with purpose. Now, I know that sometimes we confuse purpose and all these kind of things. But today, I'm going to clarify all this stuff. What I mean by this is this. It's, it, this is recently in December I read this. I read this article and I was just shocked. Right now I'm reading a lot of magazines right now uh, on habits and behaviors and all kinds of stuff. But I was so shocked at, uh, at reading this part. It said a statistic about elderly people. And if you're elderly, listen, if you're alive, God still has a purpose, a plan for your life. Amen. It's never too late. If there's breath in your lungs, you got things to do places to go, people to heal, people to touch, people to infect. But it says that 80% of elderly people made a comment or made a statement that they regret not doing the things they were passionate or loved. They regret it. 80% of elderly people. That means that 80% of this room right now can be a statistic that one day you'll wake up and you'll realize because of fear, because of doubt, because of unbelief, because of excuses, because of whatever. You finish a sentence. You can literally hinder the rest of your life and one day wake up and say, I regret I didn't do that. And so we're trying to crush regret in this house. We don't want no regrets. Now, listen, we're not perfect. Nobody here. We, we all make mistakes. We all, we all say stupid stuff. We all do stupid stuff. But listen, but God says, but do you want a clean slate? Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, he says, all right. Well, you better do that in Jesus then. It's in Jesus. And so as I was reading this, I'm thinking, man, okay, well, what do you tell the elderly people? What do you tell the people of age? Here's what I tell you. Get going. Let's go. Get ready. Because God's about to inspire you. God's about to literally revive you with vision, fresh vision. Amen? And so what happens to us? Well, here's what happens in 2019. How many had some bad things happen to them in 2019? Lift your hand. Lift your hand. Come on. Be, be with me today. How many had some hurtful things happen in 2019? How many got backstabbed in 2019? How many got lied about in 2019? How many got fired? In no, don't lift your hand. No, listen. We've all experienced some things in 2019. But I want you to know something. There are three things that happen, okay, when you choose to not change you. Number one, if you do not begin to focus on what needs to happen, you can let whatever experience, whatever hurt, whatever pain, whatever mistake, whatever fail, whatever, you can literally let it define you, destroy you, or strengthen you. See, so many times we define our life by the choices we make, which there's so much truth to that, but you don't have to live there. Listen, when you were born, you look like your parents. When you die, you look like your choices. Let's say that again. When you're born, you look like mommy and daddy. When you die, you look like your decisions. So what are you going to decide Today, Sunday, I'm not, I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm not talking about Wednesday night when you come to Elevate Night. I'm talking about right now. This very moment is what you have right now. It's either going to define you. Whatever you experience this year will either define you, destroy you, or it's going to strengthen you. You're going to look and be like, you know what? Okay, yeah, I went through some stuff. But you know what? That's good. That was just my teacher. Yeah, I was in school, didn't even know it. I'm going to go ahead and use that as a stepping stone, man, to go ahead and leap. Man, I'm going to take what the devil meant for bad, and I'm going I'm to believe what God said, and I'll turn it around, and I'm going to use it for your good. Amen? That's why you got to know the word. If you don't know the word, you don't know your benefits. 
God says, I'll take every single thing that you've experienced and I'll turn it around. I'll turn the ship. I'll turn your life and I'll use it for something good. Amen? Come on. But we have to make sure that we design something. Everybody say design. Come on. We're all designers. You're a personal designer. You design the life you want with God. That's your design. Whatever you're living right now, it's your design. It's your decision of how you're going to design the rest of your year. Because if, listen, unless you design your year, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to go back to default. Ever say default? Okay, now default by definition means repeats and returns. Kind of like what everyone's doing right now after Christmas. A lot of returns. When you don't design what your year's going to look like, when you don't define what your year is going to look like, when you don't redefine your life, you're going to default and you're going to repeat and you're going to return. Like the Bible says in Revelations, you're like a dog who returns to their own vomit. That's nasty. I got three dogs and it just disgusts me, man. My big dog, when he throws up, is nasty. Because he'll be like doing all his thing. I'm like, are you demon possessed? Like trying to lay hands on you? You know? And then he just, Wah! and then he's like, Fill and then he goes back and he eats it. I'm like, oh. Yeah, okay, but how many of us are eating 2018 and 2019? We'll leave that right there. We'll put a little marker on there. <laughs> we'll come back next Sunday. We'll finish that thought. Amen. So, the, listen, default by definition means repeat and returns. That's why you need vision for your life. Come on, vision says this. What is God showing me? Not what is pastor telling me. No, what is God showing you? Now, I know what I'm sharing with you is, is word. I get it. But what is God showing you? Where is God taking you this year? What, what are you going to do with God? With God. What will you write down in faith? Not, not write down goals that you can do. No, we need to write some things that literally say, oh, my God, that's scary. I can't believe I just wrote that. Like there's some dreams locked in your heart right now that you know that have been in there for many years. But you have grown to believe that you cannot do it maybe because you're getting old or you didn't go to school or time is running out. But that's an excuse. No, you got to get rid of the excuses and say, you know what? Obviously, if I'm going to write these goals, if I'm going to write a vision, it's going to be bigger than me. It's going to be written in faith, right? Like, for example, I was telling you, there's something I want to share with you next weekend. I'm not going to share it now. But there's something that I've been waiting for for nine years. And it's a step of major, this is from my own personal life, major faith. And I'll share it next week so I can have a part two. Get you all excited, bring you back. You definitely don't want to miss next Sunday, okay? It's going to be good. But here's what Proverbs 29, 18 says. Look, it says, where there is no vision, what? All weak. Let's read it again. Where there is no vision, what do you think is happening to you when you lack vision? You're, you die spiritually, emotionally. You know what? When, when you have no vision, you get caught up complaining, pointing the finger, doing all kinds of other things instead of just realizing that, hey, listen, stop looking at someone else's vision and get one for yourself. Amen? And so he says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Listen, when you lack vision, here's what vision, when you lack vision, here's what it makes you. It makes you negative. You know any negative people around you? I'll tell you why. They have no vision. It makes, it makes you a complainer. It makes you unhappy. It makes you fogged. In other words, you're unclear. You're like, I don't know. I don't. It's always when there is no vision, there is no clarity. There is, you can't see clearly. It, 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 it's almost like you get into this place called stuck. I mean, just think about those, those five I just gave you. What, that was the children of Israel. God gave them a vision for a land, a promised land that flowed with milk and honey. And what did they do? 
they complained, they murmured, they were unhappy, it wasn't clear, you know what I'm saying? They were stuck, and where, where did they die? Where did they die? Where did the children of Israel die? The desert. Why? Why? Because where there is no vision, the people perish. This is good. But when you have vision, listen, vision keeps you motivated. Vision keeps you spiritually grounded. When you got vision, let me tell you something. You stop being so concerned of everybody else. I got too much vision to worry about everybody else. I got too much vision to be thinking or talking or saying or I got too much inside of me. I have to focus on what got placed inside of me. So you, you, you become grounded in God. You become grounded in Jesus. Why? Because from the very first verse where Paul is telling us in 1 Corinthians, he was saying, hey, listen, all of these things, right, living, clean slate, come on, a fresh start, all of that is rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus. When you got vision, you're rooted in Jesus, in Jesus. So it keeps you growing. It keeps you focused. It keeps you moving forward. When you have vision, listen, no matter what you face in life, man, you're just like, uh-uh. I don't care. And let me tell you something. I'm sure many of you have experienced some pretty tough things this year. But you got to get up and you got to keep moving forward. You have to. You must make that decision. And I get it. Pain will keep you back. Hurt will keep you back. Unforgiveness will keep you back. But what really keeps you back is no vision. You got to have a vision. Vision by definition is this. Look at this. It's the ability to think about. Everybody, everybody say, think about. How many can think in this room? All right, well, guess what? It sounds like you're a candidate for vision. It's the ability to think about. Look at this. Or plan the future with imagination. With what? What does the Bible says? The Bible says this. Call those things that be not as though they were. We walk by faith, not by Are you hearing me? Vision by definition, the ability to think. We all agree we can think. The, the ability to plan. Aren't you glad that we can plan? Listen, is God going to plan it for you? No. Who plans? You do. You and I plan. We have two days to plan and bring something before God this Wednesday. You have two days to plan. And you're either going to do this or you're not. That's just the bottom line. And listen, he says you get to plan the future with imagination. For example, how many have ever heard of VR? Virtual reality. Have you guys ever done virtual reality? Yeah. It's like the most popping thing going on right now. Basically, virtual reality is you put on some goggles and you go into a virtual reality world. And, and you know, if you see on the screen, right, you're just like, you know, you start like you can fly, you can jump off planes. I was watching this one video where you can actually be with a huge, uh, huge, uh, ginormous what they call those make sharks and it's like the craziest thing but what what's interesting is that we put on these virtual reality glasses because we're trying to escape right our current status and we're trying to be distracted for a moment and we start seeing things right things that are like impossible come on you start doing things that there's no way I can do that in the natural. So you know what God says to him? He says, Mauricio, he says, Elevate Church. I want you to get to the place where you don't have virtual reality glasses, but that you would put on your VR, your virtuous reality glasses. Because I know that with God, you are virtuous. You are virtuous. That means that God wants us to be able to see. God told Abraham, Abraham, as far as your eye can see, I give it to you. See, some of, them, some of us can only see what we see now in the natural. God's not looking for natural eyeballs. God's looking for people that can see in the spirit, who can see supernaturally, to see things that are probably impossible with you. What are some things right now that are impossible with you? Dreams. and He says vision is imagined. It's an imagination. We got the greatest gift, imagination. Imagine yourself doing what you want to do. Imagine yourself being who you want to be. Imagine yourself having what you want to have. But make sure that whatever you imagine, that it lines up with the heart of God. Let it be connected with the heart of the Father. Because when you get God in the vision, in his vision with you, let me tell you something. 
It's going to come to pass. God is going to do it. Now, how long will that take? Hey, listen, that's between you and God. That's why we need vision, because vision keeps us motivated. Vision keeps us inspired. Vision keeps us moving forward. But where there is no vision, people, they perish. Are you hearing me today? Look at the word virtuous. Look, it means noble, wholesome, honest, honorable, principled, righteous, blameless, celibate, effective, effectual, efficient. Excellent, exemplary, faithful, guiltless, incorruptible, kosher, moral. So when you go ahead and you start putting on faith, when you start being like Abraham, as far as the eye can see, Abraham, as far as you can see, I'll give it to you. Some of us can only see what we see in front of us. That's why this whole month, all of the month of January, maybe even the month of February, we are going to talk about see beyond. God wants us to see beyond our circumstance, to see beyond what we're experiencing right now. Look at what David said. David said this. This was his prayer in Psalms 119.18. And I want you to look at this. He says, open my eyes so that I can what? See. Some of us need to ask God that question right now. Like, God, please, would you open my eyes? Because I... I'm hearing, but I'm not seeing. He says, open my eyes that I may see the wonderful truths in your law. Come on, in 2020, I want you to make a personal decision to where you get to the place where you don't read the Bible like it's a book. That we would stop looking at the pages like ink on pages. That we would come to the place where we see, when we open this Bible, it's not just ink on this book, but that we would look at it and start seeing the word, the scripture jump off the page, get in our soul. Come on, renew our spirit. Give us vision. Give us purpose. That's how when you look at John 14, when the Bible says, you know what, uh, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. If you keep reading through all those verses, look at this. It says, and the word became what? And dwelt what? So we know that the Old Testament kept pointing to Jesus. The word, the prophets kept saying, they said, there's a Savior coming. There's a King coming. Listen, when God gives a word, he is speaking a prophetic word regarding the future. So God kept speaking this through the prophets. There's one who is coming. His, his name is Messiah. His name is Yeshua. And he starts speaking through all the prophets. And then guess what happens? All these people kept speaking the same word over and over. They kept the vision. They stayed the vision. They stayed the course. They stayed committed. They stayed faithful. And it says, and then one day the word became what? Flesh. And dwelt what? Among us. Here's what I'm saying. You and I have to get to the place where you start reading this word so much that it's not just something you're reading on ink, but that ink is going to become flesh in me. And whatever I'm believing for, whatever you're believing for, eventually will dwell among you. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. The word. But you got to know this word. You have, to, you have to know what does God say about my vision. It's not just, oh, let me write this QT vision. No, like, what does God say about that vision? What does God say about those goals? Are you hearing me today? This word has to become real. It's got to become real. It's got to become raw. But that requires a new mindset. And the only way you can change the way you think is God's word. There's no other way. No other way. If you make God, God's word priority, here, here's what happens. He, he becomes the, the, the dream giver. He becomes the vision maker. And he becomes the promise keeper. When you make God's word priority, we talked about redefine your priorities. When you make God's word the priority, I'm telling you, he'll be the dream giver for you. He'll be the vision maker for you, and he'll be the promise keeper for you. But you got to keep his word priority. Amen? And listen, let, let me just, just share this about goals real quick, because you should be writing some. Um, 
a new year also helps us to reestablish goals that, that maybe you wrote down. Like, you know how that works. In January, everybody wants to lose weight, right? Everybody, everybody you know, applies for the, uh, you know, the gym cards and all that stuff. And, you know, you go in there looking all, but you've got your Nikes on, your Adidas, and got all your gear on. And, you know, you're trying to look like you're a pro, but you're not. You know, you barely know what you're doing. You're that person that pretends they know what they're doing. They don't know what the heck they're doing. Um, and, and you know what? You start going first week, yeah. Second week, yeah. yeah. Third week, snooze, right? You put the snooze button on. You know, next day, like, ah, you unplug the alarm or whatever you do. I don't know what you do. Or you don't set your alarm anymore. And that's what happens with us. That's what stats show. They say that in the new year, it, it, people that say they're going to lose weight, they're committed for two weeks and they give up. Hey, that's no different with Christians. Christians will show up to church in January. Like, Man, I'll tell you, this place will be packed in January. Come February, it'll start dropping attendance. Come Easter, everyone comes back. <laughs> two weeks after Easter, attendance starts dropping again. Come summer, attendance really drops. Come Christmas, they're all back. Listen, out of those 1,500 people that were here this, this Christmas, they all, most, listen, I'd say 80% claim that Elevate Church is their home. I don't even know who they are. But they said, that's my church, Pastor. Like, hey, well, great to see you. Merry Christmas. You know, I, clueless. I'm like, wow, where have you been? <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, but, but isn't that just like us? Listen, 2020 should be the year of commitment. The year of follow through, the year of, man, I'm going to be steadfast. I'm going to stop being moved by every little wind that blows. Amen. Come on. I'm gonna, this is the year where I'm going to stay focused. I'm going to love hard. I'm going to pray hard. I'm going to believe hard. Amen. I'm going to trust hard. That's what God wants for us. And so when you start writing your goals, I also want you to understand, don't write goals that waste your time. We got so many people writing goals that just, they're time wasters. He didn't even, if God looked at him, he'd laugh. and like, what the heck are you doing? What are you writing? We need to get, we need to get some crazy goals. Man, some, some supernatural goals that like, man, only God can do. I'm thinking, I'm, listen, and when you write this, here's what I want you to do. There's this thing called SWAT, okay? What you do with SWAT is you write your goals. That's what you're going to do the next two days, okay? You're going to write your goals. You're going to be very clear. Okay, then you're going to get this SWAT I'm about to give you. You're going to put SWAT right next to it. And the reason you're going to do SWAT is because of this. This is what we do in staff. We talk about this a lot. S, it's an acronym. S, S stands for strengths. Okay, in other words, you're going to start asking yourself, okay, where, where are my strengths in this goal? Like, and define it. Okay, well, this is what I'm good at. Uh, um, all right, well, I know that I'm good at being intentional. I know that I'm good at being on time. I know that I'm good at uh, research. I know, like, find out what is my strengths in this because it's not just a goal. I have to, I have to define what I'm good at in this goal, right? But then you go to your W. Everybody say weaknesses. Okay, what are your weaknesses? Let's say for some of you, you're someone who writes goals and then loses them. You forget about it, right? So what's a weakness? Uh, a weakness is, man, I need to stop being a procrastinator. A weakness could be, man, I need to start waking up early because waking up at the crack of noon, that ain't helping me. Amen? You know, I have to, you have to find out what your weaknesses are. Maybe you're someone that always makes an excuse for why you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So you have to expose those weaknesses. You know why? Because those weaknesses will hold you accountable. When you define them. Are you hearing me? Okay. The O starts, stands for opportunity. Ever say opportunity. And it's not just like, oh, my God, I can't wait for the opportunity for all the doors to just swing open for me. No, no. I'm talking about what opportunities do you have? In other words, what's my default? <laughs> do you hear what I'm saying? Because your default could be that I'm going to return, right, or I'm going to repeat. So what are the opportunities as well as what are the opportunities of what doors I'm going to go, I'm going to go knocking on, who, which people I'm going to be talking to, right? Opportunities could be, what books do I need to start reading? Because here's the truth. When you think about this, the reason that most people don't move forward or don't progress is for two simple reasons. 
they don't ask themselves these questions. Number one is this. Okay, what do I need to stop doing, right? What do I need to stop doing right now? And the second one is, is what do I need to start doing that I'm not doing, okay? So what do I need to stop doing that I'm doing right now? Or what do I need to stop doing that I'm doing right now? Start or stop. Which one do you need to see as an opportunity? There's some things that you need to stop doing, and there's some things that you need to start doing. But you have to define what do I need to stop doing. Maybe stop hanging out with some weirdos. Yeah, stop hanging out with complainers. Stop hanging out with slander. Stop hanging out with people that suck the life out of you. When, when, you, when you stop, listen, I didn't say stop loving. Did, you, did I say stop loving? No, you love those people from afar. <laughs> but you stop letting those people be in your circle because let me tell you something. Bad habits corrupt good morals is what the Bible said. I wonder what kind of morals you're implementing or you're placing in people's lives. Bad habits. I'm giving you the Bible. So it's not Mauricio saying cut up. No, there's some people you got to stop being with. There's some people. You, if you're not hanging around visionaries, let me tell you something. Turkeys, flock, eagles, soar. Very simple. T stands for timeline. Everybody say timeline. That means that each goal should have a DOA. And that's not dead on arrival. If you have no vision, definitely it's going to be dead on arrival. No, DOA stands for date of accomplishment. You got to put a deadline on whatever goals you set. Whether it's three months, six months, nine, you figure it out. But you, you got to have, you got to have a timeline. When am I going to do this? If you say you're going to lose 10 pounds, then put a DOA on there. Okay, and don't be that person, I'm going to lose 50 pounds. Listen, how about start by losing five? And then celebrate those five. And then, you know, so instead of saying, I'm going to lose 50 pounds by February 50 or 29th or whatever. No, no, no. Just say, hey, I'm going to lose 10 pounds in January, five in February, 15 in March. Why? You're building momentum. But when you're trying to make this big old thing, right, that, you know, come on, man. You know that the Twinkie demon's coming after you. There's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Timeline. Hey, you got, listen, the reason you need a timeline, be, here, here's why. Here's why. It, it keeps you growing. It keeps you moving. And it helps you review. It helps you see what you're not doing and what you are doing. Okay? So goals give us the opportunity to take stock and review our life. And it also tells you whether or not you're living on purpose. And it will also tell you whether you're still on course. You got to write those goals. Listen, goals are simply motivation. Vision comes from God. You need vision from God. Look at Galatians 5, 16 and 18 says this. As you yield what? Who, who has to yield? You do. Right now, as you yield freely and fully to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, in other words, until you're ready to really start coming under the submission of the Holy Spirit, until you're ready to make the Holy Spirit your guide, your director, your storyteller, your story writer, he says, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. Look at your and say, it's time to abandon. Come on, some of us got to abandon some thoughts we have, perceptions. Some of us have to abandon some, some fears, some insecurities you gotta you gotta ban listen if you don't abandon it look what he goes on to say and, and when he's talking about your self-life he's talking about your flesh for your self-life craves the things that offend the holy spirit who does it offend the holy spirit so think about it when you want to be fleshly girl you ain't offending a uh, 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 man guy you ain't offending you're offending the holy spirit the spirit of god he says, you offend the Holy Spirit and you hinder him from living free within you. And the Holy Spirit's intense cravings hinder your old self-life from dominating you. So then, the two incompatible and conflicting forces within you are your self-life of the flesh. Everybody say the flesh. And the new creation life of the Spirit. So there's a war between the Spirit 
and there's a war between the flesh. The flesh does not draw you any closer to God. The flesh draws you closer, I mean, further away from God while the Spirit is trying to woo you into God, right? Like when you go on a fast, you'll find out who's in charge. That's why we fast. Man, you take food away, you'll see who's in charge. You're really like, dang, I'm in charge, right? You're fasting, you go look at the fridge, you open the fridge, you're like, no, I'm not going to do it. You go back in there, well, there's nothing in there anyways, I'm not going to do it. Five minutes later, man, you'll still get up there knowing there's nothing in there, but your flesh is in control. You know who's boss. That's why you have to dethrone King's stomach, amen, and put King Jesus back on the throne of your heart, amen. But when you are, listen, but when you are brought into the full freedom of the spirit of grace, you will no longer be living under the uh, domination of the law, but soaring up above it amen in other words he says the old you your flesh keeps getting in the way of the new you your old you in 2019 if you're not careful is going to get in the way of the new you how many are ready to give up the old you right now for real you're say okay i got 10 of you okay let's go how many are ready to get rid of the old you how many are ready for that all right come on come on i know we'll get there we'll get there we'll get some excitement in this place 12 o'clock is probably going to knock it out of the park. That's okay. We'll work with you. How many are ready to get rid of the old you? The old you. The old you. Okay. The old me is what? Hurt, pain, depression, anxiety, fear, doubt, lust. That's the old us. Quarreling, complaining, negative. That's the old us. The new us it's different when we're led by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Time, I get it. The past always gets in the way. God wants to do something new in us. You got to position yourself. You got to position yourself. You, t- you look at Noah. We're, we're leaving now. Look at Noah. Noah, he positioned himself for rain. You, you hear me? Noah positioned himself. He prepared himself. He got ready for something that didn't exist. When Noah built the ark, it had never rained on planet Earth. He was doing something that was supernatural. He couldn't, he couldn't understand it. Let me show you. Look at your neighbor and say, get ready. Come on, I'm about to go Mexican TD Jakes right now. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Look, Genesis chapter 6. Look, 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 look. So God speaks to Noah. He says, hey, build me an ark. I'm going to destroy this earth. I'm going to flood it. And so I want you to build an ark. Noah's like, what's an ark? A boat. What's a boat? Never existed. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Look at this. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you will build it. This is how you will what? What is God giving him? Vision. Instruction. Did Noah ever see a boat before? So if he's never seen it before, what's he giving him? A vision. Vision is something you've never seen before. It's imagination. God was giving him an imagination. But then he tells him, this is what you do. And he goes on to say, this is how you're going to build it in 2020. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Do you see how God has a brain? Yes? Do you see how God's intelligent? God gives instruction. God gives details. God writes it down. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high and all around. Put a door in the inside of the ark and make and, and, and make lower, middle, and upper decks. But I will establish my covenant with you. Who's going to establish the covenant? See, you write the goal, God will establish it. You write the vision, God will establish it. You write down all the things God's telling you, God said, and we'll build it together. Amen. You can build it or you can build it with God. I have learned there's things that I have built that I have completely destroyed. And then there's things that I have brought God into the building and God has built. Amen. Unless, listen, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain is what the scripture says. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark. Come on, some of us, we got to take this word and say, I'm entering 2020, man. I'm entering in a, str- in a strong covenant with God. You know what covenant means? It means there, it, is, it is a legal uh, abiding contract declaring that you and God are in complete relationship 
intimacy. We are completely partners. We're not getting divorced, God. I'm in it to win it with you. God says, when you do that with me, I'll be in covenant with you. I want, I want God to be my partner 2020. Look, and he says, and you, look at this. He doesn't just think about you. He says, and you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you are, are Listen, your kids are entering with you. Your babies are going in with you. They can be kicking and screaming. They're coming in with you. Why? Because God's covenant is on you. Amen? His presence is on your life. His hand is on your life. And it says, and Noah did some of the things that God commanded him to do. I just want to see if you were paying attention. Noah did what? So are you going to do everything it takes to follow Jesus in 2020, yes or no? You got to do everything. God's not a buffet line, okay? You don't pick and choose what you want. You either take all of God or none of God. All in or all out. There's no in between. God wants committed people yielding. What does what scripture say? He says, I'm looking for people that are yielded and fully committed 2020 yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and so I, I love this because not only did Noah do everything that God said but think about this stand on your feet let's go let's go let's let's get out of here because now we'll stay longer and I don't want to do that don't miss next week you, you don't want to miss next week part part two and there's something I need to share with you next weekend think about this how stupid do you think Noah looked building something that never existed before? How stupid do you think? He looked stupid. Like, can you imagine how many haters were hating on that vision? Like, laughing at him. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? Is, what's rain? <laughs> what is that? Like, what, what's water's going to come from heaven? What? Are you crazy, man? Look at this loco. And we know that the world was so violent and corrupt and just perverted. It was, it was just gone, man. That's why God was like, I've tried. And, and check this out. So just think about how many times Noah had to stay committed to the vision. He, he, oh, this is going to blow your hair back. And if you don't have any, you're going to grow some. Okay. <laughs> check this out. When God gave Noah the vision, he was 500 years old. 500 years old when God told him to build an ark. Noah finished building the ark at 600 years old. That means that God gave him a 100-year vision. Some of us, we need to get the spirit of Noah in us and realize when God says in Proverbs, where there is no vision, my people perish. Noah got a hold of vision, and that vision kept them motivated, kept them inspired, kept them walking in love, kept them. Now, I'm sure, just like us, he's a man. I'm sure he had moments of doubt, moments of fear. I'm sure he questioned, I wonder if I even heard God. 100 years. He waited for 100 years. And then the floods came. And let me tell you something. So often we think that when we write the goal, when we write the vision, it's going to happen how you wrote it. Well, let me tell you something. I know that we have this idea that the rain came and flooded the earth. The rain didn't come from the sky. The rain came from the earth. It came from the earth. Let me tell you something. The rain is not going to just come down on you. The rain is going to come from inside of you. God is going to rain. He wants to rain in your life. So that he can flood your life with favor. He wants to flood your life with peace. He wants to flood your life with hope. He wants to flood your life with faith. He wants to flood your life with vision. God wants to do this. Think about this. Noah had to overcome every single negative spirit that kept, kept trying to get his vision to die. He had to overcome every single lie, every slander, everything. Just imagine, please, get in Noah's shoes for a minute. Imagine all the stuff he had to go through. People that probably started helping him who quit on him. People that started believing with him stopped believing. But Noah stayed focused on the vision. There's an acronym for faith. 
Look on the screen. Faith means forsaken all, I trust him. You got to abandon you. You got to do what the apostle Paul said. He said, I died to the flesh. I'm going to die to this flesh. I'm going to forsake this flesh. I'm going to forsake my ideas. I'm going to forsake me, self, for him. That's what Noah said. I forsake all because I trust him. Lift a hand to heaven. I want you to close your eyes, please. I want you to imagine right now. Please imagine yourself in 2020. Imagine yourself with vision right now. Please do it. Put on your virtuous reality eyes right now, please. What do you see? Please see something. See something. 